Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Don't forget to click like and subscribe if you want more daily updates on audiobook. The White Boy Shuffle by Paul Beatty The Shoes Buying basketball shoes was much harder than I thought. Unlike the skate shop, where there are only three different brands and maybe ten styles to choose from, Tennies from Heaven was the footwear equivalent of an automobile showroom. A sneaker emporium where the walls were lined with hundreds of shoes and salesmen dressed in silk sweatsuits patrolled the floor, handing out brochures, shaking hands, and checking credit ratings. The basketball section took up the entire third floor. An $80 sneaker caught my eye and I hefted it in my hand as if its weight might tell something about its quality. I was about to call for a salesperson when I heard Scobie snickering behind my back and singing, Buddies, they cost $1.99. Buddies, they make your feet feel fine. I put the shoe down and Nicholas pushed me through a sliding glass door into an area of the store called the Proving Grounds. A section of the store where the state-of-the-art, more expensive models were on display. Before the staff allowed me to try on any shoes, I had to sign a release stating that if my new sneakers were forcibly removed from my feet and the crime received any media attention, I would blame the theft on the current administration and not on niche marketing. Even with all the paperwork I could only try on one shoe at a time, since I wasn't accompanied by a bonded legal guardian or a basketball coach. Whenever I slipped my foot into a new shoe I'd hobble over to the mirror like tiny Tim Cratchit and blink really fast, trying to create an optical illusion so I could imagine what wearing both sneakers at the same time would look like. After some eye strain I managed to convince the guy to let me try a different shoe on each foot and teetered over to Nicholas to ask his opinions. He vetoed the sporty barbarian on my left foot because they were sewn by eight-year-old Sri Lankans who worked in open-air factories, received no lunch breaks, and were paid in candy bars. The Air Edi Amin Firewalker on my right foot, a colorful suede high top designed to look like a traditional African mask, was nixed because although the shoes performed well on asphalt, they tended to slip on gym floors, and besides, the kids chanted, coup d'etat, foup d'etat, at anyone who wore them. Nick suggested the high-tech Adidas Forum Tous, an outrageously expensive pair of plain white basketball shoes, computer designed for maximum support, something called wearability, and exactly like the pair he was wearing. The salesperson, smelling commission, closed the deal with a spiel about French cowhide hand sewn with French thread by French seamsters who were paid by French entrepreneurs who donated a percentage of every shoe sold to help build basketball courts in ghettos throughout the world. I wanted to comment on how building more basketball courts just created a demand for more sneakers, but instead gimped around the store, hopped up and down on one foot, and put $175 on the counter. The salesman smiled and handed me the other shoe and the carbon copy of my release form. The hair tut. I had $25 left and felt that my next purchase should be a basketball but Nicholas insisted that having the proper haircut was more important than having a basketball. He recommended Manny's Barbershop and Chiropractic offices on the corner of 24th Street and Robertson Boulevard. Manny Montoya was a tall curly-haired Chicano whose mission in life was to improve the posture of every hunchbacked ex-farm laborer, sway-backed prostitute, and stoop-shouldered hoodlum in the neighborhood. Manny only offered one haircut, the Sunkissed Special, which was a concentration camp baldy with a hint of stubble. Ballplayers and bangers lined up for haircuts, sharing copies of Jet, Puffo, and Guns and Ammo till a barber called their names. Hey bro, peep this firme fiut. Air-cooled, magnesium-plated, single-action Geppetto Pinocchio long-nosed .22 caliber. Nah, cuz, you want one of these fingerprint-resistant Buger GAT polymer 10mm with the emerald handle. Well, I think we can both agree that this centerfold Jaina Dell MES is fine. What's her hobbies? The usual, scuba diving, horseback riding, and skiing. Where in fuck does Jet Magazine find all these colored cowgirls who ski? On the other side of the room, near the plastic skeleton, 
lowriders who'd gotten whiplash from taking corners on two wheels and thrown their backs out because they'd spent last night bunny-hopping their Oldsmobile cutlasses down Crenshaw Boulevard waited patiently for adjustments. Pretending the cricks in their necks didn't hurt. Manny excitedly pointed out the window and exclaimed, Hey look, there's Gilbert Suavecito's Cherry 45 DeSoto convertible and Iris Chacon riding on the hood in a bikini. The hot rodder's heads spun around for a look at Gilbert's champion lowrider and the Mesopotamian buttock television star Miss Chacon. A chorus of agony rang throughout the shop as the men re-wrenched their necks for nothing more than a glimpse of Rafael Munoz giving a ride to Gina, Scully Bones, Sanders on the handlebars of his custom Schwinn Stingray 5-speed. Manny laughed and dug his thumb into the nape of my neck. The pain forced my head down and he sheared long furrows down the middle of my scalp. In the far corner of the shop, a circle of old men, Indios and Africans, played electronic poker games and swapped migration stories. I sat in the barber chair concentrating on keeping my head still and straining to hear the stories of how their families ended up in Los Angeles, far from their ramshackle southwestern and southern routes. One man, Mr. Tillis Everett, the attendant at Zoom Zoom Gas, chewed on beef jerky and talked about how one day in Biloxi his father came home with blood on his shirt sleeve. It was a Tuesday, and Daddy walked in the door, kissed Grandma on the cheek, and said, Mama, I have to go. Grandma said, I'll have your stuff ready in five minutes. The mechanic spit out a wad of unchoable gristle, picked his teeth with a thumbnail, and continued. Things was understood down south. If you made a decision to hit a white man, you made the choice to kill him and relocate. Wasn't no left, right, left, don't fuck with me no more, shake hands and let's be friends. They used to say, hope the man with the rope ain't got no telescope. It wasn't no running in the water to throw the dogs off your scent. They bring the hounds round to the other side and pick you up soon enough. You had to get to a chicken coop and rub handfuls of chicken shit on your shoes real thick like. Dogs would get tired of smelling that shit and they'd refuse to follow the scent. My daddy arrived in Los Angeles smelling like a henhouse toilet. Niggers out here is out of luck. Ain't no chicken shit in Los Angeles. Lots o' oh, chicken shit niggers, no real chicken shit. Couldn't run away from Los Angeles if you wanted to. I couldn't keep my hand off my newly shorn skull. It sprinkled on the way home and the droplets of rain soothed my tender scalp. When I got home my mom pressed my noggin into her breasts and sobbed that I looked as if I were on a hunger strike. My sisters were taking turns doing bongo solos on my head when the phone rang. It was my father. The ball. Boy, you see my portrait of the Northbrook necrophiliac in yesterday's paper? Yup. Looks a little bit like Dwight Eisenhower. Is it true this guy goes round fucking skeletons and shit? Yeah, some janitor at the medical school caught him sticking his dick in an eye socket. What a numbskull. Very funny. Your mother tells me you've started playing basketball. Yeah, me and some of the fellas. Just don't get one of those Jack Johnson black buck hey look at me, I'm an athlete baldheads, you hear me. Dad, I need a basketball. Only scrubs buy basketballs. Dad. I'll see what I can do. Put your mama on the phone. About two hours later a police cruiser drove by the front of the house and chirped the siren. I looked out the window and saw a hairy white arm fling a brand new basketball into the front yard. As I ran out to retrieve the ball, a book landed at my feet. The book was a thin paperback entitled Heaven is a Playground. From what I could glean from the back cover, it was a sports journalist's treatise on a pack of inner-city Brooklynites who spent the better part of their days scampering around a basketball court known as the Hole. Inside my father had scribbled a note, read this and remember you're a Kaufman, and not one of the black misfits sociologically detailed herein. Soon it was time to try out my new sneakers, new basketball, and new haircut. 
Scoby and I sauntered into the park and he pointed out some of the aging local legends seated under the trees, sipping from crinkled brown bags. Ben, Yoda, Morales reputedly was so quick that when he changed directions, the sneaker to concrete friction caused his shoes to spontaneously combust. Over the years he'd lost a step and all anyone ever saw was puffs of smoke wafting from his sols as he slithered to the basket. In his prime, Nathan, Sadu, Ng could go up for a rebound and leave a dirty footprint on the backboard. Now he was a shoeless stumblebum begging dimes from the younger kids. Scoby too had a rep blind Melissa, Sonar, Kilmartin who could do anything on the court but chase the ball when it went out of bounds, turned in our direction and raised her beer to him. What's up, Scobie, you gonna serve niggers today like I used to, baby? Who that with you? That first day Nick and I went to the park, about fifty players were standing in the hot sun, waiting their turn to play. When the game in progress ended, Scobie walked onto the court, touched his toes, alternately lifted his feet by the insteps until his heels touched his butt, and waited for whoever had winners to tell him who else was on his team. There was some unspoken protocol at work, and Nicholas apparently had diplomatic status. Soon a huge crowd gathered around the sidelines. Right from the start there was an intensity on the court that hadn't been present in the previous game. Players who usually spent most of their precious court time arguing and disputing every call were silent and stealing glances at Scobie whenever they made a shot or did something particularly impressive. Scobie's pre-game announcement, niggers who come here for the attention best to leave now, seemed to have had some effect. I watched Nicholas play a few games and tried to figure what the big deal was. His team always won but it wasn't like he was out there performing superhuman feats. He didn't sprout wings and fly, he didn't seem to have eyes in the back of his head. There was always someone who jumped higher than he could, handled the ball better. Nick would make five or six baskets and that was it. After winning his fourth straight game, he told me to walk over to the basket and dunk the ball. Huh. Do what you did at school the other day. I walked under the basket with my brand new ball cradled under my arm and flushed the electric orange orb through the hoop with two hands. A tall boy wearing a dark gray t-shirt that read Wheatley High Varsity Basketball in faded green letters sauntered over to me and started to small talk. You know Scoby? We go to Manischewitz together. Your name Gunnar Kaufman. Aha. Uh -huh. You wrote that poem? Um, um, um. You wanna run? In as low a voice as I could muster, I said, yeah. I had a rep before I ever played a game at the park, although I wasn't sure exactly what for. We played until nightfall. During what was shaping up to be the last game of the evening, it became impossible to see the basket farthest away from the streetlight. It was as if we were playing at the lunar surface during the half moon. One side of the court was in complete darkness and the other fairly well lit. The score was tied at 10-10 and someone suggested we call the game a draw on account of darkness before someone got hurt. Scobie said, next basket wins. My team had the ball and we were shooting at the visible basket. The high schooler in the gray shirt took a short shot that circled around the rim and fell out, right into Nick's hands. Scobie took two speed dribbles, losing the man who was guarding him, and headed up court. When he crossed half-court he disappeared into the darkness, then quickly reappeared in the light without the ball. A second later you heard the crashing of the chain net as the ball arced through it. Game. Skipping the ball through my legs, imitating the moves I'd seen during the course of the day, I rounded the corner onto Sherborne Drive and realized what Scobie's rep was for, he never missed. I mean never. 5. Summer before my first year of high school was the summer niggers stopped sitting next to each other in the movies. We jaywalked, spit on the sidewalk, broke curfew, but strictly abided by the unwritten law prohibiting black boys over 15 from sitting next to each other in the dark. One yawning unoccupied chair always belied our closeness, 
separating us like a velvet moat filled with homophobic alligators and popcorn as we solved cinematic mysteries with deductive street smart reasoning. The pockmarked motherfucker from the country club gots to be the killer. Niggeraro, is you crazy? It's the left hand honey with the juicy Maybelline lips and the fucked up German accent. It's always the foreigner. Kill again, you sexy thing, you. Both you Sherlock Holmes cokeheads are wrong, it's the Doberman Pincher. The mutt is hypnotized by the psychologist to kill on his say, so. Didn't you see the bloody paw prints? In the past three years me, Nicholas, and Psycho Loco had become a heroic trio of sorts. We were the three musketeers, all for one and one for all, sipping watery lemon-lime soda from the same straw, gallivanting in the streets, sounding off like wind chimes in the city breeze. By high school I was no longer the seaside bumpkin, clueless to the Byzantine ways of the inner city. But I hadn't completely assimilated into Hillside's culture. I still said, aunt, instead of aunt, and, you guys, rather than, y'all, and wore my pants a bit too tight, but these shortcomings were forgiven because I had managed to attain a look. My sinewy physique drew scads of attention. I'd be on the bus or standing in line at the store and strangers would come up to me and knowingly nod their heads as if we shared some secret. The more straightforward ones would speak up and interpret my dreams for me. You play ball? Don't say no, you got that look. I can tell by your calves. Skinny, powerful legs and the way you walk pigeon-toed, small s, n, all. You ain't nothing but a ball player. Despite the pigeonholing, it was fun to answer the inquiries and watch the populace swoon. How tall are you? 6'5", baby, 6'5". I'd exaggerate by an inch and a half. Not everyone was enamored of my height and athletic ability. There were those who didn't care that I'd spent hours in the city's gyms and parks perfecting my game. Not that I had ever asked anyone to care, but to some ghetto subcultures I was nothing more than a tall wise-ass punk who deserved a serious comeuppance. Whenever I stopped to listen to the street-corner sermons of the all-albino brothers and sisters of Nappy, new African politicized pedantic yahoos, the speakers always singled me out as a traitor to my race, the dreaded heretic of the nation of sun people. After prophesying the founding of New Africa, a glorious day when the United States government would turn over five southern states to legions of turban-pink-eyed heliocentrists, their leader, Tasha Rhodesia, would defiantly ask, any questions from the unbelievers? I'd raise my hand with a puzzled look on my face. A look that differed from my basketball mean, a look that said, maybe if I heard the right syllogism I'd make a worthy convert? Tasha Rhodesia would wave a light-skinned arm lined with copper bracelets cast from precious African metals ceremoniously over the crowd. You, the proud young warrior, obviously of Watusi stock, what white propaganda infests your fertile African mind? How can a bunch of people such as yourselves, who give themselves names like wise intelligent, p-knowledge, and erudite judicious, be so fucking stupid? In Afrocentric slapstick, an offended neophyte would smush a bean pie in my face and banish me from the promised land. Then there were the bands of bored Bedouins who roamed hillside, silently testing my resolve by lifting their t-shirts, revealing a belly button and a handgun tucked in their waistband. Sup, nigger? In response I'd lift my t-shirt and flash my weapons, a paperback copy of Audrey Lord or Sterling Brown and a checkerboard set of abdominal muscles. You niggers ain't hard, calculus is hard. All right, gooner, you keep talking smack. Psycho Loco ain't going to be around forever. My friendship with Psycho Loco did have its perks, but Scobie was right, Psycho Loco asked for a lot of favors. My backyard became a burial ground for missing evidence, warm guns and blood-rusted knives rested in unmarked graves under little mounds of dirt. I had nightmares about the ghosts of convenience store clerks and ice cream truck drivers floating among the fruit trees, stuffing their puncture wounds with rotted fruit poultices. 
One Halloween night Psycho Loco rang the doorbell in a black knit whodunit mask and with a nickel-plated 9mm in his hand. I opened the door with a mocking, trick or treat, and put a candy bar in his flannel shirt pocket. Look at you, 19 years old out here knocking on doors begging candy. Why you ain't bag snatchin, homie? Psycho Loco walked past me, snatched off his mask, and asked in a shaky voice if he could take a shower. Ma, can Juan Julio take a shower? Yes, long as he cleans the tub afterward. After a few minutes I noticed clouds of steam drifting down the hallway and into the living room. He must have forgotten to close the door, I thought, and walked to the bathroom. Psycho Loco was standing naked, looking at himself in the mirror. Eye to eye with his demons and crying so hard he had tears on his knees. I pulled back the shower curtain and handed him a bar of soap. He stepped into the mist and slipped a hand into my mom's loofah mitt and said, don't go nowhere, okay? Yeah, yeah, I said, trying not to embarrass either of us by acknowledging Psycho Loco's pain. Just don't use my mom's Australian chamomile shampoo. Use the red jojoba extract. I sat on the toilet and turned on the radio so I wouldn't have to listen to Psycho Loco's cathartic wailing while he scoured his skin raw through two weather reports and three traffic updates. When he finally got out of the shower, he told me to get dressed and meet him at the wall in 10 minutes. I rinsed the tub clean of slivers of skin and curlicue body hairs swimming in rivulets of his blood like microscopic bacteria. When I arrived at the wall, the gun totten hooligans were waiting for me, their raffish frames casting impatient shadows in the moonlight. Smoking generic cigarettes, cradling unopened quart-sized bottles of carta blanca like brown glass-skinned babies, they raised their eyebrows to say hello and cavalierly tossed up gang signs. Those who weren't propped up against the wall in gangster leans squatted on the ground, flat-footed, perfectly balanced in the refugee tuck. The squat was a difficult position that most yoga teachers have problems assuming, but the disenfranchised in all societies do it with ease. I knew better than to assume the poor indigene pose. I always ended up on my tippy toes, my wobbly equilibrium betraying my privileged upbringing. Joe Shenanigans waved me over and I braced myself against the wall next to him. I folded my arms and wondered why Psycho Loco had invited me to the party. Joe offered me a sip of pink swill from a pint of Mad Dog 2020ths, which I declined. It was tempting, but I heard that after drinking that shit you glowed the next morning. Thought you stopped drinking, Joe? Only on special occasions. Like what, sundown? Watch your back, the paint is wet. I looked over my shoulder and saw a dripping scrawl that read, Pumpkin raising hell in hell October 31st RIP Happy Halloween. Pumpkin was dead. I tried to conjure up some grief, but it was hard to feel any sympathy for the pudgy redbone devil who had almost pierced my ear with an arrow in the Montgomery Ward Sporting Goods Department. Who killed him? Not for nothing, but him and Psycho Loco was trying to fucking rob the fucking Koreans. Joe Shenanigans was a skinny boy, black as a penny loafer, who claimed he was a Sicilian from a long line of mafiosi. He had a cheesy wisp of a mustache, and his skin sagged at the joints because his diet consisted entirely of frozen Italian foods like turkey tetrazzini, fettuccine alfredo, and chicken parmigiana with linguine. Holding a conversation with Joe was like talking to someone who was simultaneously channeling Martin Scorsese, Al Pacino, and Mama Celeste. Bada bing, bada bam, bada boom, psycho loco and pumpkin, the gun to Ms. Kim's chin, open the register. But Mama Mia, Ms. Kim ain't listenin', dot. Ms. Kim was the half-black, half-Korean owner of the corner store. Fathered by a black GI, she was born in Korea and at age 17 was adopted by a black family and raised in Fresno. To us, when she was behind the counter in her store, Ms. Kim was Korean. When she was out on the streets walking her dogs, she was black. Ms. Kim and I used to kid each other as to who had the flattest rear end. 
Ms. Kim busy cussin psycho loco out. You know how she be talking Korean and black broken English at the same time. First you steal my eggs and now you're gonna steal money? Nah, motherfucker. How you be so cold blood? I feed you kimchi when you baby. Break north beefo, I call mother. So Psycho Loco fires a warning shot to get her attention, and he hits one oh, dem huge inflatable maelstrom 500 malt liquor bottles. The fucking ting falls on Pumpkin's ass and suffocates him. Fuget about it. Fucking J. You mean A. Yeah, fucking A, hey, where your boy Nick Scoby? He's listening to Miles Davis and refuses to come outside. Maybe tomorrow, he says. Psycho Loco situated himself in the epicenter of the gathering, looked over his incompetent troops, and spoke in a soft voice. Do we have a quorum? he asked. Hell nah, the boys responded. With that Psycho Loco theatrically twisted the cap off his beer bottle. Most groups of boys pay homage to a slew of dead homies by saying, this is for the brothers who ain't here, spilling a swallow of drink onto the sidewalk. Not the delinquents from the gun totten hooligans. Though less elaborate than a Japanese tea ceremony, the GTH drinking ritual was equally reverent and definitely longer. The gun totten hooligans started out as a local dance troupe called the Body Eccentric. When Los Angeles's funk music scene was in its heyday, kids from different neighborhoods met at the nightclubs and outdoor jams to dance against one another in breakin' or poppin' contests. After losing battles to companies known as the Flexo Twists and the Invertebrates, the kids from Hillside often limped home with sprained ankles and broken bones from botching a complicated move. The citywide ridicule became unbearable when, after a humiliating defeat by the Lindy Poppers, a one-legged hillside boy named Pegleg Greg beat a contestant to death with his artificial limb. To ensure the survival of the species, the dance troops evolved into gangs and the war was on. Countless drive-bys and handkerchief purchases later, the gun totten hooligans were the bravest but most inept gang in Los Angeles. Suffering more casualties than the rest of the city's gangs combined, the hooligans had developed a tradition that required that the thirsts of every parched and perished comrade be quenched. Thus the endless beer ceremony. Riff raff, rest in peace. Pour. Tank tank, sweet dreams. Dribble. Weebles, six feet under. Splash. Lil Weebles, smoking weed with the angels. Spatter. Baby Weebles, dozen and decomposin. Dot. Bloop. Bloop. When GTH finally finished honoring their dead, they'd gone through six containers of beer and Psycho Loco was standing ankle deep in a pool of beer foam. The main reason for GTH's high death rate was that initially the gang didn't tote guns. They fought their enemies with antiquated weaponry such as blow darts tomahawks, and spears. The founding members thought the moniker would be a good subterfuge. Who'd suspect a gang called Gun Totten hooligans in a vicious gangland lassoing? The gang owed its formidable notoriety to Psycho Loco's ruthlessness. Tattooed with naked women and adorned with a chain of paper doll figurines, Psycho Loco's arms resembled the kill tally on the cowling of a World War II airplane. The red Swiss cross on his right forearm represented the paramedic whose death had resulted in the bid upstate. The morning party for Pumpkin heated up into a war dance, the boys got antsy and began sloshing beer on one another and hollering hoodlum apothems. What we gonna do when a GTH crip takes the final dip? Take a set trip, load the clip, cruise the strip, give a punk ass buster a hellified fat lip. Nothing is even Steven till everybody's bleedin'. Pumpkin, we love you. We'll make M pay. Psycho Loco yelled for everyone to shut up and grabbed a boy named Butane by his eyelids. Everyone flinched in vicarious pain and uttered a barely audible but collective, ow. Psycho Loco went into his proud drunken warrior tirade. What do you mean, we? Every time one of us gets capped, who does the revenge killing? 
My ass. When I first moved here, you motherfuckers was scared of every Vado on the block, especially Raymond Keniston. Juan Julio, Juan Julio, Raymond took my money. Raymond threw my bike off the roof. Raymond threw my father into the garbage truck. Punk ass yellow rat bastards. Joe shenanigans, when Raymond stepped on your pet frog Kermy on purpose, didn't I make him eat it and every fly that landed on your screen door for two weeks? That's because you my gumba. My main molen yen from the old country. Fuck it, I'm tired of doing y'all's dirty work. After the payback for pumpkin, that's it, I quit bangin', dot. Every gangster in GTH dropped to his knees and started kowtowing. You can't quit, Psycho Loco. We need you. They knew if Psycho Loco quit, there would be a mini pogrom on GTH members. Psycho Loco laughed, released Butane's eyelids, and plopped down next to me. We drank some beers, and eventually a few of us made a foray through Cheviot Heights in Psycho Loco's van. We celebrated Halloween and tried to forget about Pumpkin by taking turns smashing car windows with a crowbar. The BMWs and Mercedes Benzes were all small fish when we saw our Moby Dick, a 35 foot motor home parked in front of a huge three story house complete with marble portico and a set of tall wooden doors. While Captain Ahab and the rest of the crew harpooned and skinned the mobile home, this sailor, drunk with jealousy and resentment, crept across the lawn and uprooted a small metal sign that read this property guarded by Chef Tech Security. After an hour of crippling cars, we weaved down Nalga's drive back home. Psycho Loco made a left onto Wiltern Boulevard, reached under his seat, and pulled out his 9mm. The boys passed the gun around, commented on its weight, barrel length, muzzle velocity, then stuck their arms out the window and into the humid air. With a pop the streetlights flashed, then burst into incandescent amber mini-novas, the plate glass windows collapsing like families. Shoot this shit, Kaufman. I didn't hesitate. Grabbing the gun in two hands, I squeezed off a three-shot sound poem that slapped a complacent hot Southern California night to attention. Aim, nigger. I am. What you shooting at? God, motherfucker. Nothing goes faster than fifteen bullets. In need of another fix, we stopped by Letty's, Psycho Loco's girlfriend, for more ammunition. Hopping back into the car with a sly look on his face, Psycho Loco showed us a handful of bullets and put the car in gear. As we sped away, he announced with a hint of contriteness in his voice, you should have seen the look on the old girl's face. Where you going? Like I know. Riding in the back seat of the car, I felt as if I were circling the neighborhood on some R-rated carousel. Familiar landmarks blurred into the sunrise, the stupid merry-go-round music refusing to go away. When I arrived home, I planted the metal chef tech flag in the crab grass, threw up on my mother's lone flowering rosebush, and tried to tear a set of unwanted chevrons from my memory. Gooner, Pumpkin's funeral is at 4.30 tomorrow afternoon. I'll be there. I slammed the front door a little too loudly, distracting my mother from her morning eggs and crossword puzzle. Gooner, where you been? Shooting up the neighborhood. Ma, I'm becoming so black it's a shame. I wanted to explain to her that living out there was like being in a never-ending log rolling contest. You never asked why the log was rolling or who was rolling the log. You just spread your arms and kept your feet moving, doing your best not to fall off. Spent all your time trying to anticipate how fast and in what direction the log would spin next. I wanted to take a seat next to my mother and use this lumberjack metaphor to express how tired I was. I wanted to chew my runny eggs and talk with my mouth full. Tell her how much I missed the calm equipoise of my old life but how I had grown accustomed to running in place, knowing nothing mattered as long as I kept moving. I wanted to say these things to her, but my breath smelled like wet dog shit with a hint of sulfur. That morning I dreamed of chasing a brown-haired white boy down a flight of stairs and into the normally busy but now empty intersection. 
The boy and I used to be friends, but he had wronged me somehow, though I couldn't say exactly how, and he and I both knew that the transgression merited death. The streets looked as if they'd been evacuated because of a nuclear threat or a hurricane gathering momentum off the coast. I chased the boy past a row of abandoned cars and caught him in the middle of the street under a traffic light stanchion that was swaying wildly in the wind. I shot him twice in the chest and he fell in the crosswalk. When I inspected the body, there were no bullet wounds, no blood, just two frayed holes in his yellow Oxford shirt. Bending down, gun in hand, I opened his closed eyes as the noise of sirens and bystanders filled the streets. Was I hero or criminal? Psycho Loco ran over and wrested the gun from my hands, saying that he'd take the fall so I could go to college. I awoke recalling that it hadn't been long ago when I was the only black person in my dreams, now I was shooting white kids in the street. At church I slumped in a pew worn smooth by restless rear ends shifting from side to side trying to keep their owners awake through another young black man done gone sermon. Scoby, Psycho Loco, and the gang had heard this speech so often they called out the biblical passages before the Reverend, Corinthians 7 13, Leviticus 2 verse 10, Peter 4 25, Book of Job 1 verse 17. The reverend gripped the sides of his podium and tried to outshout his hecklers and impress upon the rowdies how Orwell, Pumpkin, Ferguson had wasted his precious youth. If the young man had only spent more of his time in church, he might have spent a little less time in that box. I picked up a Bible and attempted to follow along with the reverend's eschatological harangue, but I didn't know where the books of Corinthians, Peter, and Job were. Flipping back and forth between Old and New Testaments, I ripped the book's thin pages to shreds. As the mourners prepared to file past the corpse, the minister asked the aged organist to play some sorrowful hymn the family had requested to accompany their son's soul to the hereafter. The organist's knobby fingers methodically pounded out a lifeless tune, halted every two bars by violent coughing attacks and sticky organ keys that required a butter knife to pop them back up into position. Pumpkin send-off dirge was more like one long emphysemic wheeze. His parents started to cry, and I imagined Pumpkin sitting up in his coffin saying, get me to the fucking hearse, already, and disassociating himself from the fiasco. Scobie removed a tape from his portable cassette player and popped it into the church's sound system. The mewling strains of Miles Davis echoed off the paneled walls. The grateful organ player stopped sweating and lit a cigarette. The hooligan strolled past the open casket, tossing bullets, shotgun shells, joints, switchblades, and cans of beer into it. If Pumpkin found himself in need of money, he could open a general store in the afterlife. When it was my turn to pay my respects, his diminutive creole, colored parents shook my hand with tearful solemnity. It's mighty nice of you to stop by. Our son used to tell us how he beat you to a pulp when you first moved into the neighborhood. Good luck with the basketball and the poetry. I looked into Pumpkin's brittle face and tried to hide my indifference. Propped on one knee, I placed my elbows on the edge of his box and started to utter a phony prayer. Then I noticed a black light painting of a black Jesus bathed in purple light hanging over Pumpkin's body like a guardian angel, a lime green crown of thorns embedded in his fuzzy crushed velvet afro. Clearly Pumpkin was in reliable company. I asked Jesus if, after he'd taken care of Pumpkin's wounds, he could help him clear customs and grant him permission to enter the afterworld despite the armaments, marijuana, and alcoholic beverages laid across his chest. I ended my request with an earnest, Amen, loud enough for everyone to hear. During the eulogy at Immaculate Lawn Cemetery, I was absent-mindedly shooting imaginary jump shots into the empty grave when Psycho Loco told the reverend to shut up and asked me to recite a poem before they laid Pumpkin in the ground. I composed the following poem. Elegy for a Vifuse Midget. Pumpkin, his homunculus casket. Only big enough for four pallbearers, is lowered into earth. Next to his grandfather. A diminutive light-skinned black man who passed for white munchkin. 
in The Wizard of Oz, offered a lollipop to Dorothy. Then drank himself to death. With pint size blended whiskey residuals. A squat family cries. And shakes pudgy fingers. At the wicked witch. Of the west side. The reading signified my unofficial ascension to poet Maudit for the gun totten, hooligans and by extension the neighborhood. My duties were similar to those of a Li Pe or Lu Chao Lin in the employ of a Tang dynasty warlord, immortalize the rulers and say enough scholarly bullshit to keep from getting my head chopped off. It wasn't all bad. As word spread of my lyrical prowess, I earned movie money as a human hallmark card, reading sappy epithalamiums at weddings and dour elegies at funerals. Once in a while a poet from another fiefdom seeking to challenge my reputation would swagger into the neighborhood demanding a poetic showdown. We'd duel an impromptu verse, tonkas at seven paces or sestinas at noon, no use of the words, love, heart, and soul. I sent many bards home in shame. Their employers carried them out on stretchers as they frantically thumbed through their rhyming dictionaries wondering how they had fucked up a rondo so badly. I heard that one quixotic laureate I defeated has taken an eternal vow of silence and crisscrosses the country playing the bongos at the graves of famous poets for food. Homegrown Young G puts down his joint for a moment and through red-slitted eyes checks out his burned-out homies sprawled all over Mama's burgundy leatherette corner group asleep under a blanket of smoke tucked in by the slow jams on the radio who are these men he's grown up with traded comic books with been tested for VD with what are they really like when none of the others are around do they? Take bubble baths. Stop and stare at the setting sun. Like to vacuum? Watch the McNeil slash Lehrer hour on the sly. The young G rousts his boys. Hey. All I know about you motherfuckers is that y'all are niggers who care. One of his boys lifts his groggy head and shouts back, and that's all you need to know. Two days after Pumpkin's funeral I was in Psycho Loco's living room helping him choose an appropriate eyeshadow to go with his mole brown skin and the tight blue chiffon dress he was wearing. We'd narrowed it down to the chartreuse cinnamon and the peccadillo plum. Admiring his lusty visage in his compact, Psycho Loco flapped his false eyelashes, blew himself a kiss, and went with the peccadillo. Today was the day the gun totten hooligans would avenge Pumpkin's ignominious death. Most of the boys wanted to dismember Ms. Kim, the owner of the corner store where Pumpkin died, but Psycho Loco talked them out of it, astutely pointing out that the families of every fool in the room would starve to death because Miss Kim carried them on credit for two weeks out of the month. It wasn't very hard to find a scapegoat. The obvious choice was the ghost town Black Shadows from the Bilkinson Gardens projects. The Shadows had been GTH's archenemies for so long that gang members on both sides termed the animosities, the crusades, and here was the GTH strike force, dressed in drag and primping in preparation to go ghost-busting. All the homeboys were, hooligan down, flaunting their colors like rhesus monkeys in heat showing off their blue asses. They fought over who would have the largest breasts and who would wear the expensive wanton perfume. They stuffed halter tops with blue toilet paper, daintily knotted blue scarves about their necks, smoothed pleated blue skirts, cringed as they slipped their blue painted toenails into blue high heels and blue steeled .25 pistols into blue leather handbags. The idea was to roll into Ghost Town and take their hideouts by surprise. I wished the homies luck and was headed home when out of nowhere Psycho Loco grabbed me by my throat and planted a sticky kiss on my cheek. Where you going, Gooner? I'm going home. You not coming on our little sortie? Hell nah, not unless you got a bulletproof brassiere in the closet. Look, just come. You play ball and write, this is what I do. I shoot motherfuckers. You know I'm going to be at every one of your games this year cheering your ass, so you come and cheer mine. You'll be our date. I sat in the back seat of a convertible Volkswagen Rabbit, squeezed between Joe Shenanigans, who looked stunning in a Liz Claiborne pantsuit, and fat Noemo Clark, 
who wore a Macy's pregnancy jumpsuit set off nicely with silver hoop earrings. Pookie Hamilton drove and Psycho Loco rode shotgun. We went into battle, a three-car armada of horsehair-wigged corsairs sailing over the open concrete, sipping rum and listening to Pookie Hamilton tell sailor stories. Pookie was something of a neighborhood celebrity. He had an unwanted cameo in P. Fay Offi Fair, a nationally syndicated live-action video docudrama. In Pookie's episode, a clean-cut white cop is driving down a dark street, quickly glancing from the road to the camera and explaining what it's like to patrol the streets of West Los Angeles. A drop-top Volkswagen exactly like the one we were riding in speeds past the officer's patrol car. The cop looks into the camera as if he's talking to his partner and says, see that. That nig, uh, turd, uh, guy is probably intoxicated. The camera pans to the windshield, you see the Volkswagen swerving in and out of its lane. Every five seconds or so, a fountain of vomit spews out of the driver's window. The police car's red and white lights turn the freeway into a disco. The police officer requests to see Pookie's license and registration. Pookie hands the officer his papers and accidentally drops a beer can onto the street. The officer asks Pookie to step out of his car and tells him that he is being stopped for suspicion of driving while intoxicated. Pookie willingly but unsteadily steps out of the car to take the sobriety test. The cop says, Sir, will you please count backward from a hundred? Smiling into the camera, Pookie agrees and says, Dredna Eno, Enanidenen, Thgaiidenen, Nevis, Eidenen. The next scene shows Pookie handcuffed in the back seat of a patrol car and on his way to waking up with a hangover in jail. The whole ride over, I watched Noah Mo Clark dig his fingernails into the palms of his thick hands, peel off layers of skin, roll them into tiny flesh balls, and pop them into his mouth. No Mo's goal in life was to be a criminal mastermind. He thought if he could remove his fingerprints, he'd be the bane of the FBI, a mystery thief slipping in and out of the Federal Reserve, leaving nothing behind but greasy smudges. The drawback to no MO's plan was that all the sandpapering and scraping had turned his hands into a blistery mass of flesh so tender he got paper cuts from counting money. Unable to hold silverware, no MO ate nothing but marshmallows, cotton candy, and white bread. When feeling brave, he bought large bags of French fries and waited for the hot morsels to cool so he could eat them without scalding himself. A favorite GTH parlor trick was to get no MO so excited about his grandiose dreams he'd want to slap hands with someone in celebration of his genius. The sound of a no MO high five was a sickening splat not unlike the scrunch of a family of snails being stepped on. No MO came away from these handclasps alternately screaming in pain and blowing on his hand to take away the sting. Cruising down Central Avenue in the old business district, we were plainly behind enemy lines. The rusty alarm boxes over the barred doors to the pawn shops and soul food kitchens all read, Sears, Roebuck and Company. Alarm system, in lightning bolt quotation marks. Mountains of Sears all-weather radial tires snow-capped with white Sears Kenmore appliances in disrepair filled the vacant lots. Feeling a little homesick and hoping to motivate the troops, Psycho Loco stood up and yelled, Sears sucks. Montgomery Ward's rules. Following his lead, shouts rang from every car in the convoy. Wards. Wards. The outburst triggered a small avalanche of Sears diehard batteries, which rumbled down a vulcanized slope, crushing a toaster oven, to the joy of the transvestite soldiers. After we had driven for about 15 minutes, Noamo slowly removed his hand from the seat, green ooze momentarily clinging to Pookie's vinyl upholstery, and pointed to a metal archway. There go Bilkinson Gardens, he said. We drove up to the main entrance. Psycho Loco pursed his lips and winked at the security guard. The guard smiled, removed a rubber from his wallet, opened the wrought iron electric gate, then turned his attention back to a small black and white Sears television. Bilkinson Gardens was a slight misnomer. 
There were no bee-pollinated flowering fields or lush meadows populated by butterflies and snapdragons. Just stagnant and algae-laden ponds formed by the runoff of leaky fire hydrants and clogged sewers, serving as landing pads for mosquitoes and flies. Let's be on the lookout for these friggin' calzones, warned Joe shenanigans. I don't know about yous guys, but I wanna whack these fucking strombolis. The caravan broke up into search and destroy teams. Our platoon drove west, easing past rows of rundown bungalows till we saw five guys dressed in white Lacoste shirts and white golf hats standing on the porch of a small brick cabana. They looked like golf pros sipping lemonade at the 19th hole, leisurely rehashing the last round of play. As we got closer, Psycho Loco straightened his tits and whispered their names, Casper, Lil Spooky, See-Through, Opaque Nate, and the Invisible Nigger, all of whom were staring lustily at the females in the car. With a flirtatious squint in his eyes, Joe Shenanigans lasciviously ran his tongue over his top lip, sending the ghost town gangsters into a frenzy. The courtship ritual began with the sugary sweet words of budding love. Set that shit out, baby. God damn, girl, your breastesses is big. A sandwich is a sandwich, but your titties is a meal. Hey, ho, come here and let me put a little something on your chin. Pookie played coy and piloted the car around the block, the hard-ons of every ghostbuster following us like dowsing rods. Damn, Joe, if you was a girl you'd be a fucking slut. You was looking at them niggers like you wanted some dick bad. Ah, uh, nigger, fuck you, I bet we pull that skirt off your ass, your panties be wet as a motherfucker, stank bitch. Psycho Loco put a cassette into the deck, barraging Bilkinson Gardens with a screeching aria. Mood music, he called it. The boys quieted themselves and made ready. I expected guns, but Psycho Loco and Joe Shenanigans removed fancy crossbows and arrows from under the seat. No M.O. was filling balloons with liquid drain opener. What about the guns? I pleaded. You do know that the Second Amendment gives you the right to form a militia and bear arms? By the fear invested in me, I hereby proclaim the gun totten hooligans a militia. So bear some goddamn arms. Psycho Loco turned around in his seat, shook his head disapprovingly in my direction, and told me that whenever the gun totten hooligans acted vengefully, they stuck to the old ways, and tradition meant no guns unless absolutely necessary. The car wheeled around the last corner and I cowered in my seat as no M.O. nodded the end of his last liquid drain opener balloon and Psycho Loco and Joe Shenanigans with their arrowheads with aerosol deodorant. A fool from Ghost Town called out from the street, struggling to be heard over the wailing French contralto, I knew you fine bitches would be back. Why don't you all come inside, drink a little reunite on ice, and get busy? The car braked to a slow glide, Psycho Loco and Joe lit a lighter, and the tips of their arrows flamed like giant aluminum matches. The boy in the white hat cupped his hands to his mouth. Hey what's up with that music? With a war whoop, Psycho Loco, no M.O., and Joe stood up, and a salvo of flaming arrows and balloons zipped through the air. The stunned homeboys from Ghost Town dove for cover, their hats flying off their cornrowed heads and parachuting down to earth as the arrows bounced harmlessly off the brick bungalow onto the concrete, where the fires petered out like dud Fourth of July fireworks. One projectile found a home in the rear tire of a Buick Supersport, causing the car to howl and list to one side. They wouldn't be chasing us. Noamo had the best aim, one of his balloons exploded on one boy's chest. Succumbing to the fumes, the kid dropped to the sidewalk, gurgling and clawing at his burning eyes. A hyped up Noamo hopped out of the car and yelled in the wounded boy's face, induce vomiting, motherfucker, and hustled back to the car. Eventually Ghost Town rallied and rushed the car as we pulled away. The fastest boy pulled a sawed-off shotgun out of nowhere like an outlaw magician, and a knot of buckshot danced on the car's rear end like water droplets on hot oil. The opera singer sang on, 
her voice blowing past my ears as Puki sped out the main entrance and toward the freeway. Psycho Loco, what are we listening to? Dali Block May. It's from Act 2, the lovers declare their undying devotion, then they die. I noticed none of the boys bothered to remove their wigs or makeup. I placed one hand over my heart and raised the other high in the air and celebrated life by hitting the high notes with the rest of the fellows. Somehow I knew the words.